Welcome to this preparation for breastfeeding and the first few weeks class. My name is Jackie Hall. I work as a lactation consultant and I've worked in the NHS for 32 years, including 14 years as an infant feeding lead. The overall aims of this session are one, to help you to learn about breast milk's immense benefits to both you and your baby. And number two, to help you understand how breastfeeding works, which hopefully that will empower you to go forward in, in the first few weeks after the birth. And also number three, to equip you with a realistic picture of what the early days and weeks may look like as you seek to establish your milk supply. In the first section of the webinar, I've entitled this Breast Milk and How Breastfeeding Works. And in this section, we are gonna cover colostrum and mature milk, hormones, how breastfeeding works and how to prepare for breastfeeding in the light of that. And also the importance of learning how to hand express your breast milk. So why breastfeeding? We understand that there are, there are copious amounts of uh, research, evidence-based research, which has shown both long and short term health advantages to both baby and mum if you breastfeed. So what we do know is that babies who breastfeed or who receive breast milk have a reduction in risk of gastroenteritis, chest infections, ear infections, urinary infections and even diabetes. There's also a reduction in risk of allergies and some childhood cancers and SIDS, which is sudden infant death syndrome. We know that some studies have shown that when they've looked at um, people who are in their you know, 50s or 60s or older, if they've been breastfed as babies, they've often had um, better heart health, so lower cholesterol, lower blood pressure. Um, and we also know there's a reduction in risk of obesity and especially if a baby is exclusively breastfed in that first six months, the more exclusively breastfed, the lower the risk of obesity in the future. And all of these points on this slide, and there are many more than this, I've just labelled a few of them. They've all been, they've all have many studies that point to every single one of those things. It isn't just one off studies that, that have shown this. So we're looking at across populations and we do have to bear that in mind. Um, it doesn't mean that if you don't have, if your baby doesn't have any breast milk, then your baby will be ill with all of these things. That it doesn't mean that at all, but it's a reduction in ric risk across populations. And for mums, we don't always talk about the, the benefits to mums, but there is a breastfeeding can reduce your risk of various cancers. On this slide, I've just labelled ovarian cancer and breast cancer, but there are also lots of other cancers as well. And, and it, it's useful to look at as much information as you can. If you want to look at more studies, you can look at the UNICEF UK BFI website which gives all the latest research around breast milk and its health advantages to babies and mums. And on this slide I've also labelled hip fractures, there's a reduction in risk of osteoporosis which can cause fractures. So it, it seems that the you know after you've stopped breastfeeding there is a protective element um, in your bones to, to prevent this um, nasty disease called osteoporosis. So what do we know about breast milk? Well, it's species specific and we know that across the mammalian kingdom, lots of different animals, they all have a different type of breast milk specifically geared for their offspring. And humans are no different to that. It's a living complex substance as well. It's a bit like blood. You know, blood is a very complex um, substance that has so many different components to it. And it's the, the same with breast milk. We don't fully understand everything about it, but scientists are always working on breast milk to learn as much as they can. And they've even extracted stem cells from breast milk. 
changes composition as well. So even throughout a particular day, the composition of breast milk may be different. And as your baby grows and develops and changes, once again, breast milk can be different. Always changing its composition, that's normal. The first milk is called colostrum. So while you're pregnant at the moment, your body is already, if, you, if you've got to 16, 17 weeks or more of gestation, your body is already producing colostrum. So it starts very early preparing for breastfeeding. And colostrum continues for the first two or three days after the birth, as well as in pregnancy. You may or may not leak milk when you're pregnant. Um, it doesn't mean that you won't be able to produce milk if you're not leaking. Some women can um, do leak milk and they can express a bit of milk as well. But um, that, that milk continues, as I say, for the first couple of days after the birth. And it's the composition of it, it you know, it's thick, sticky. It can be various colours as well, ranging from white right through to brown, believe it or not. So you can have yellow, orange, any of those colours. If you lined up a, a, a you know, ten women and they all expressed a bit of colostrum, you may have various different colours seen it with that milk, and that's all normal. We do know that it coats your baby's gut, so it's almost like a Teflon coating from the first feed, which protects babies, prevents allergens and pathogens coming in, um, and, and it, it gives that protection to your baby, even from that first feed. It's also packed with protective factors, so various what they call immunoglobulins, antibodies, which protect your baby from bacteria. And, and it is very, very um, concentrated, that. It's also a concentrated form of nutrition for your baby. Very small volumes are produced, though, so that is normal because your baby has a tiny little stomach on the first day after the birth, you, you, your baby's stomach is the size of a marble. And even by day three, it's only the size of a shooter marble. Not that I'm a marble expert, but uh, a shooter marble isn't that much bigger, really. And even by the second week, 10 to 14 days, say, your baby's stomach is around about the size of a golf ball. So babies don't need large volumes of milk. And colostrum is perfect for your baby when your baby's born. If your baby's born full term, there'll be that first couple of days with very small volumes of colostrum. So babies need to feed frequently. That is normal. And some babies are feeding every hour. It also has a, a laxative effect, which clears what they call meconium from your baby's system. There's a, a lot of excess red blood cells in your baby's body um, after the birth and your Body, your baby's body needs to get rid of that and so the first poo that your baby does is very black tarry meconium but colostrum has this kind of laxative effect to help your baby get rid of that which is important in that in that first day or two. Mature milk you do often hear people asking about when mature milk suddenly appears but actually what happens is more volume of milk starts to to happen after that first couple of days and so the composition of the milk starts to change so there's a kind of interim milk but by about the third day sometimes the fourth day uh, if you've had a cesarean section you will be aware of feeling full um, and you this is what we call the mature when the when the mature milk comes in you sometimes hear people say that but in a way it's the same milk it's just more volume, different composition because there's more volume. So how does breastfeeding work? What we do know is that while you're pregnant, there are special hormones that are getting to work right now, preparing your body to produce milk. And there are certain hormones which will prevent your body making too much of that milk at this moment in time while you're still pregnant. But once the placenta has been delivered, the hormonal things change and your body is then able to make this milk and produce more of it. So after the birth, 
One of the hormones that you hear about is oxytocin. And this hormone is triggered by your baby suckling at the breast and, and even positive thoughts that you may have. It, it's, it, we all have oxytocin in our bodies that gets boosted when we're nice and relaxed. And um, th it is a, a common hormone for males and females, but it also has this effect when baby's suckling, it'll be boosted. And it also causes milk to be what they call let down from the milk making machinery inside your breast. Inside the breast, there are what looks like upside down bunches of grapes. And those grape like structures, milk is made and stored in those. And when a let down happens, these little structures contract and push milk out of the breast. The effect may be felt as a tingling when the letdown happens. So it usually happens after your baby has done a number of sucks at the beginning, fast sucks to, in effect, call the milk down and then the milk lets down. Some women may feel the letdown, uh, you know, more severe than a tingle. It might feel quite powerful and some would even say it's quite painful at first, but it usually does settle down that. Um, some never feel it at all so it's not a sign that something is going wrong not everybody feels the letdown but the levels of this hormone oxytocin are higher when your baby is near so if for instance your baby um, was born prematurely and was in special care it's very handy to be near to your baby to to help with the milk production just being near to your baby can can be very useful uh, to get those hormones boosted. It can be temporarily inhi inhibited by stress. And of course, you may feel stressed in the first few days. So, you know, the, the more relaxed you can be, the better, the more support you've got around you, you know, harness that support so that you can relax and f get your baby near to you as often as possible. Another really important hormone is called prolactin and that's triggered by your baby suckling at the breast but it's also triggered by doing skin to skin with your baby. So we do talk a lot about spending goodly amounts of time with your baby in skin to skin to boost prolactin, the, the hormone that actually makes milk because this hormone acts on the milk making cells and, and on this slide it says in the alveoli that's those little grape like structures which i've mentioned the the hormone will act on those structures to make milk it can also suppress ovulation so you do find um when you are breastfeeding that you may not ovulate you may not have periods for quite a number of weeks or months depending on how much breastfeeding you're doing but that would be normal some women do get their periods back within six weeks even when they're breastfeeding, but um, not to be alarmed if that doesn't happen. What we do know is that prolactin needs to be stimulated early and frequently to be effective long term. We know that for some women, and it isn't true for everybody, but for some, the first two weeks after the birth are really, really important to get that early and frequent stimulation of the breast. So if your baby isn't feeding particularly well or latching very well, which sometimes happens, then you do need to pump your milk to get give that stimulation at the breast to boost the prolactin hormone. Because there are some women, if they don't get that first two weeks of very frequent stimulation at the breast, it may impact on their supply later on over the weeks. But I have known some women where they got off to a tricky start and didn't get that early expressing or feeding and they did go on to get a full supply later on so it is very individual but to stand every opportunity give you every opportunity to to get your supply established be really mindful of that in the first couple of weeks so these two hormones prolactin and oxytocin work together to trigger feelings of love and mothering behavior and they induce a, a feeling of calmness actually and well-being so they are a real boost to mum and baby and this is true for all of the animal kingdom that these hormones work very well to keep mum and baby very connected and for the production of milk 
it also will enhance your bond with your baby as well. So just as a reminder, the more prolactin surges you trigger in the early days, the more your breasts will be enabled to make milk for the next few months. This slide shows how it works. So you see here the baby suckling on the right breast of that mum. That sends nerve impulses to the brain and a pituitary gland in the brain gets stimulated. Hormones get released, oxytocin and prolactin, and both breasts receive the message. So the letdown happens on both sides. All those little grape-like structures in both breasts contract at the same time and milk is effectively pushed out um, down towards the nipple. And your baby who has been doing fast sucks at the beginning to send those signals to call the letdown will suddenly feel milk it in the back of his or her throat and start to suckle. You could say that the whole process is demand and supply and La Leche League, uh, a breastfeeding organisation, have coined the phrase that the, the breast is a factory, not a warehouse. And I think that can be really useful to remember that, you know, it's not as if you have all this milk available and then your baby sucks from the breast, finishes that milk and you have to wait for your breast to fill up. It doesn't work like that at all. The more demand that goes in at the breast, the more your body on each breast actually separately is, is sent signals to make milk. And the analogy is if you go through um, your local supermarket, through a checkout with your six tins of beans, for instance, as as the beans go through the checkout, it signals to somewhere in the shop on the computer system to put more beans on the shop floor. So as milk comes out of the breast, your body is actively going to work to make more milk on that side. So it's all about emptying. Demand going in, drawing a bit of milk off, your body then making more. So the more your baby feeds frequently, you know, if your baby feeds more frequently, your body will make more milk. If your baby doesn't feed very well or is very sleepy, you, your body will not mil make the milk on that particular side if, if there's no emptying going on. So always think about emptying being the key thing. And I will talk at some point in this webinar about how you can help your baby get more milk if you do have a sleepy baby or even a baby who isn't attaching very well at all. Because if, you, if your baby is not stimulating the supply something else has to do that so there are techniques that you can use so just remember that the more the breast is emptied the more milk is made and that also means that don't be alarmed if your baby suddenly feeds much more frequently over a few hours your body will still be making that milk and they they say that there is always about 25% residual milk left in the breast even when your baby has a good feed so try not to lose confidence when there's a frequency situation going on because babies do go through cluster nursing and growth spurts which I will mention later on but all of this is normal in these first few weeks and even months actually. So the more you breastfeed, the more milk you will produce. And that goes for women with twins. If you're expecting triplets, your body has capacity to make all the milk that's needed. The size of your baby doesn't matter. You know, you could have a small baby or a large baby. A lot of I have heard a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, um, I, I'm having a very large baby. I'm not going to be able to make the milk. It's just not true. You know, if your baby is feeding effectively in swallowing your body has capacity to make all the milk needed for a large baby or babies in some ways i mean if all of your hormones are working as they they need to be then your body has capacity to make gallons of milk if needed so how can how can you prepare for breastfeeding in the light of these things one one point i would make is learn as much as you can beforehand about breastfeeding and, and learn, you may want to go into more depths about how it works, but learn as much as you can in advance so that you're, you're kind of informed. Um, because it is hard once you've had the baby and you're very tired, most people are very tired after they've had a baby. 
sometimes it can be difficult to get the support needed if things are very busy um, on the maternity unit, for instance. So having some knowledge beforehand can help um, and, and prepare yourself for that. Learn where to get support. So in whatever area you are in, um, learn in advance where you can access support so that once you've had your baby, you will have access to that as soon as possible if needed. And prepare your closest people to support you in the early weeks. And that's certainly around practical issues, housework and all of the, you know, making meals and things, all of those things to support you in your efforts to establish your milk supply because there will be a lot of sitting around feeding your baby and if you can focus on that and less on the everyday practical things within your, your house for instance that can be really useful it may not be possible of course but if you can harness any support beforehand so that people will be aware to that they are on on call to help you that can be really really useful the next slide talks about what about your significant other? So partners are really, really important in, in helping you to get breastfeeding established. And we know that the success rate of breastfeeding, if partners are involved and supportive, it is, is huge comparatively to having no support at all. There, there is absolute research to back that up. So do encourage your supportive partner to learn as much as they can about breastfeeding as well to know what to expect and to be on hand and some of the th ways that they can help as well as practical support like bathing your baby nappy changing cuddling taking your baby out in a pram or a sling if needed emotional support like encouraging and praising you for what you're doing understanding and sharing your goals and social support, you know, maybe asking for help if from other sources if needed on your behalf, helping you to get out and about so you can boost your confidence out in public. All of these things can be really useful. And finally, in this section, I do want to talk about learning how to hand express your milk, your breast milk, because that it's a it's a really um, important skill to learn which can be so useful all the way through your breastfeeding journey. So why is it important for you to to be able to hand express? Well one of the things is that if, if your baby is unable to feed at the birth, just after the birth, your colostrum can be expressed and given by a little spoon or a cup or a syringe to so that your baby has your milk even a low the, your baby may not be latching on so well right at the beginning. It might even help your baby to attach as well if you can express a little bit of milk off and your baby can smell that milk and just to aid that uh, attachment process. But also it's possible that you may get overly full, especially when mature milk starts to uh, proliferate around the third or fourth day. So if you get overly full or at any point in breastfeeding, because this it can happen if you get overly full to the point of pain a little bit of hand expression can really help to take that little bit of milk off to help your baby to attach better and to prevent a block duct for yourself as well it can also deal with a block duct if you do get a block duct or mastitis the hand expressing is part of the treatment really returning to work as well some women will use hand expression as a means to express the milk Sometimes it's just useful to keep yourself comfortable using that technique when you're at work. So you may not use it as your main way of expressing, but it's still going to be a really important thing. And for some women, it can work better than, than a pump itself. Although the majority of women will say that uh, an electric pump has worked better. But sometimes the combination of hand expression and pumping with it with a a pump can be a, a really good way to increase the yield of milk. So how can you help with the letdown? This is a, it's all about getting relaxed beforehand before you actually 
do the technique to get milk out of your breast. So you're looking at a relaxing atmosphere and that might involve music or just keeping the lighting low, keeping nice and warm, back massage. <laughs> you, you may um, use massage on the breast, not dragging the skin of the breast, but just massage to help as a preamble before the actual technique of of hand expression. Even gently nipple rolling, that can also help. The touch, smell, photo of your baby as well can be very useful. So the actual technique itself of how to hand express. First of all, you're actually trying to find the right spot on the breast. And that can be found because you're going to be putting your hand like a C shape, thumb on top, fingers underneath. But you need to find out where you're going to put that. So you're looking for um, a change of texture in the breast. What you can do is pinch the nipple and work back and when when you find an area where the texture feels that little bit different it'll be like a bit of a circumference around this area that's where you're going to be putting your thumb and your fingers underneath like a C shape so you make a C shape and it usually works out about 2.5 centimeters back from the base of the nipple but it is different you'll find it's different from person to person where you end up doing the actual technique and the technique is to squeeze and release squeeze and release squeeze and release you basically get a rhythm going and unfortunately nothing happens at first you may be doing that for a minute or two before you actually see anything. So don't be alarmed at that. Keep going, squeeze and release, squeeze and release until eventually there'll be small drops. If you keep going after that, the squirts will happen. And then if you keep going, the flow will subside. So the squirts become less until nothing else comes out of the breast. You then can rotate to another area and go through the same sequence all over again. So there'll be nothing, and then there'll be drops, and then there'll be squirts, and then the squirts will subside, and then you find another area somewhere around the, the breast, the clock face of the breast. So basically you can keep on working your way around the clock face, but remember that at each spot you are going through that sequence. Squeeze and release, squeeze and release, nothing happens then drops then squirts and the squirts subside and then you rotate you can then move on to the other breast if you're wanting to get milk out of both breasts it all depends on the reasons for getting milk out of the breast which can differ in this second section i've called it after the birth and the first few days important things to know and skills to learn. We've already talked about hand expression and that is one of those skills. But in this section, I've talked about the importance of skin to skin, feeding patterns and what to expect, how to position your baby at the breast, feeding cues, ways to know that your baby is getting enough milk, safe sleeping, what to do if your baby is sleepy, what to do also if your baby isn't latching well or not at all and what to do if your baby is born early, premature, before 37 weeks. So this little section is on skin contact. We know that skin contact and lots of it and lots of frequent feeds in the early days will increase the potential for ma making milk in the long term. But we also know that skin to skin, it's not just a lovely thing to do it actually is a kind of physiological thing and it will stimulate the release of prolactin and oxytocin hormones so it will actually help to boost supply it helps to calm and relax you and your baby it can regulate your baby's heart rate and breathing and even can regulate your baby's temperature the other good thing is that it stimulates your baby's breast seeking behaviors and interest in feeding so if you place your baby in skin to skin, those natural breast seeking behaviours tend to kick in. It also stimulates endorphin release for yourself. 
these feel-good endorphins that can be very positive and it reduces cortisol hormone in your baby so that's a stress hormone so it actually keeps your baby calm it keeps you calm and um, all very positive so skin contact can help with positioning and attachment it can help if your baby is unsettled just to calm your baby down if your baby is refusing the breast skin contact can also aid that attachment and help your baby to get back on the breast again and um, if you're suffering from postnatal depression which some women do that can also be a really good useful positive thing between mother and baby to keep you calm and connected so we know that it helps to increase milk production and enhances your bond with your baby so in regard to babies and how often they feed, it's important to know that babies feed pretty frequently and around the clock. Nighttime feeding is completely normal. Remember that your baby's stomach is very small with small volumes of milk. So the name of the game really is to breastfeed early and if your baby is not latching for any reason or, or suckling well, then express your milk as frequently as your baby would have been feeding. Breastfeed often, and as your baby feeds little and often, your milk supply increases. And get help with positioning as well, if you feel you need to, to ensure your baby gets a good deep latch. And remember that the first fast sucks at the beginning can be quite strong, but once the milk lets down, it should feel easier. Pulling and tugging would be a normal sensation, but pain is a step too far. So try not to let anyone tell you that pain is normal with breastfeeding because pain is pain is a good thing in a way because it's tell, telling you that something is not quite right and it gives you a chance to alter something around the positioning. But never think that you have to endure pain all the way through a feed because pain is usually alerting you to the fact that your nipple is getting squashed a little bit. Um, there could be other reasons for pain as well. But get help with positioning. Ask a health professional, a midwife or a health visitor or your local infant feeding team try not to sort of just be gritting your teeth at every feed and enduring breastfeeding with pain you know on every latch this slide just shows you that there are many different shapes and sizes of breast and nipple and we know that babies can breastfeed from almost any breast really but it just it kind of makes you realize that positioning is going to be different from person to person with their particular baby. Babies are different sizes and shapes as well and you can even get breasts that are very different from the left side to the right side so positions that have work really well on one side may not work so well on the other side or a mirror image of that even. So babies can potentially feed anywhere around the clock face of the breast so there are hundreds of positions and once again, please don't let anyone tell you that there's only one or two positions to feed a baby. That That is a kind of an old-fashioned thing that used to be said when we didn't have a lot of knowledge around breastfeeding. The the aim really is to help help all of you to work these things out with your baby. You and your baby know that there are many, many different positions you may even make up a position as long as it's comfortable so know that your baby can feed particularly anywhere around the clock face of the breast there is a term called biological nurturing and and this refers to what what we call also laid back positioning what we know is that if you get reclined back on your settee and you literally place your baby in a cuddle position on your body, your baby is geared to start searching for the nipple and crawling down. You'd see a lot of head bobbing and twisty little head movements and babies tend to use their hands and their feet to crawl down 
to self-attach and you often get a much deeper latch in these positions as well so you you would be reclined back and your baby is using your body as a real support mechanism um so in the first instance it can be really useful to allow your baby even a very young baby in that first week after the birth to self-attach to crawl down and to self-attach your baby is geared as soon as he or she brushes past the nipple naturally your baby's mouth will open and your baby's tongue comes out to scoop up the breast tissue and get a deeper latch often the the tongue is a little bit lower down as well just because of gravity because of those kind of positions that facilitate that so um try biological nurturing but we can extract a number of general principles that happen naturally with laid back biology which you can imagine being the normal biological way certain principles we can glean from that so that you could try any other position that you want as long as these principles are in place so these principles are one your baby's head and body generally need to be in alignment so you you don't really want your baby having to turn his or her head but that his head and body or her head and body will be in a kind of straight line it's a lot easier to swallow if you were drinking a cup of tea you wouldn't tend to turn your head to the side to swallow it it's a lot harder it's a lot more uncomfortable than if your body your head and your body are in alignment so that's why you're trying to keep your baby's head and body generally in alignment and your baby's head needs to be able to tilt as well to get that good latch so try not to put a finger or a hand on the back of your baby's head and your baby feeling you know being held really close that's actually about stability your baby needs to feel a hundred percent stable for the whole length of the feed so always ask yourself if you were your baby would would you feel a hundred percent stable what can often happen is if you feed your baby if you sit upright and use all the strength of your arms to hold your baby and you just happen to move a little bit forward or you move a bit in a split second your baby could think that they're going to fall you know they lose that feeling of the whole body being supported so that can be enough for a baby to lose the latch and end up on the end of the nipple and that, that can be very painful if your baby ends up on the end of the nipple so always think about keeping your baby very close to you and very stable and if you are bringing your baby to the breast rather than just letting your baby do laid back biological um, nurturing your aim is to allow the nipple to sit just under your baby's nose so the idea is that you bring your baby to you so that the nipple will sit in that little area just under your baby's nose the contact of your nipple there will cause a big wide mouth to happen and you're waiting for a big wide mouth before you swiftly bring allow your baby to latch recline back then if you can to replicate that feeling of stability for your baby and and whatever position you do use you do need to be able to sustain that for the whole length of the feed and as you can see there's a photo there of a baby attached and stable with all the principles in place the other important thing is to learn to pick up on your baby's feeding cues and babies can be often telling you that they're ready for coming to the breast much earlier than waiting for them to cry you know there's lots of little signals which go on leading up to that crying is actually a protest cue you know to to say you know i've been telling you for the last 20 or 30 minutes that i'm ready for a feed calmer babies latch better so it's not always possible to get your baby to the breast that early but if you can all the better because your baby is more likely to attach better so what are those feeding cues 
so you might even see rapid eye movements now your baby would be in a light sleep at that point but that rapid eye movements are still classed as a, a feeding cue surprisingly your baby might wriggle a bit or get a little bit restless starting to root looking around mouth moving him moving his little head from side to side bringing hands to mouth or sometimes a baby will sort of bring the hand to the head or the mouth and there might even be little murmuring noises now just remember crying is the baby's last resort so if you can bring your baby to the breast as early as possible all the better and babies come to the breast for warmth and for comfort and just to chill out and also for nutrition but what we understand is that if you bring your baby to the breast for all of those reasons then the milk supply tends to look after itself so how can you know that your baby or your babies are getting enough milk this is the the big question that many women ask and the most important signs that will tell you that your baby is doing okay especially in we're talking about in the first three to four weeks here you're looking at at least five or six wet nappies if your baby is in disposable nappies every 24 hours in that first week it's a little bit different just after the birth because on the first day your baby usually does one wet nappy second day two third day three and by the fourth day you're looking at about five or six wet nappies and from therein you'd expect the five to six if your baby is in cloth nappies then it's usually about six to eight per 24 hours and pooing is another really good guide you're looking at um, if you were to scoop up all the poo in 24 hours two to three two pound coin size amounts the equivalent of that over 24 hours and the consistency softish yellowy coma kind of color mustard could be seedy or any of those are normal um poos that you would expect once again though in the first few days leading up to the fourth or fifth day when this would be true you would expect lots of that black meconium in the first day leading to dark brown poos to dark green and then by the fourth or fifth day the yellowy cormary kind of colour and the amounts that I've suggested so as I say that first few days will be slightly different but from the fourth or the fifth day you'd expect a daily pattern then and weight gain where you expect babies to gain anywhere between four to seven ounces per week in the first three months on average some babies gain a little bit less than that they could be classed as slow to gain weight babies but there are certain things that that you can do in that situation and um, certainly if your baby isn't gaining weight and following um, generally their centile line in the in the red book then you know ask for support so that you can really help to boost your supply if needed you would also expect baby to be settled during and after feeds but i do want to mention that sometimes some babies are so tired in the first week or two that they're they're classed as sleepy newborns and they may actually look as if they're settled but they're not actually asking for food so that is a very different matter where you would have to proactively wake a very very sleepy baby who isn't waking to feed you'd need to wake them every two hours but normally you would expect babies to if they're feeding okay they would be settled during and after feeds and you would also ha know that there's a lots of swallowing going on in those feeds some babies attach to the breast and they don't they do a lot of nibbling but not no swallowing so they're not actually getting the milk and making that milk um, so swallowing is important but really the first three points on that slide are the your most important evidences wet and dirty nappies and weight gain the pattern of feeding will tell you nothing because it's normal for babies to suddenly do frequent feeding it doesn't mean that you haven't got enough milk the opposite actually your baby is boosting supply on this slide i put what is normal when it comes to patterns of feeding so know that babies will feed at least every two to three hours um around the clock at first 
but this also means they could also be feeding every hour and during a growth spurt which happens there are some specific times when these happen at nine to ten days there is a growth spurt so you could find that your baby is feeding every hour through nine to ten days i don't mean four nine to ten days around the nine to ten days mark uh, night and day there's also a growth spurt around the two to three week mark where you get two to four days and nights of very frequent feeding you get another one at six weeks and there are others even after that so be aware that even if you thought that there's a certain pattern of feeding it could change during a growth spurt and your baby will be there a lot you know you may feel like you fed your baby on both sides put your baby down and he or she is up again wanting to feed again just keep bringing your baby to the breast during these growth spurts and cluster nursing usually happens from about the second week onwards and that means a, a, a period of frequent feeding every evening this can go on for a few hours sometimes it's just a couple of hours but it can be a few hours for some babies and that is normal it usually goes on for about nine or ten weeks that frequent um, cluster nursing every evening some women ask do I offer both breasts is that a normal thing to do and it's a good rule of thumb to do that in the early days and weeks to offer both sides so let baby feed from one breast babies usually feed anywhere between 10 to 30 minutes different from baby to baby um, once your baby has come off the breast offer the other side that would be a general rule of thumb and next feed start your baby on that second breast as the priority one the second time round, and let your baby also be offered the other breast as well and in this way your body will build up supply on both breasts there are situations where some women have a real oversupply of milk and they will generally find that they only need to offer one breast per feed but that is a very specific situation most people you know we would be encouraging most women to f offer both breasts at each feed so what happens if your baby is very sleepy i have already touched on that that there are some babies who are just not waking up to feed um in the in the newborn period so if that is true for your baby you it means that your baby will not stimulate your supply and therefore your body won't make that milk so you often find babies losing weight because of that so it's really important that a baby is proactively woken up and when your baby is at the breast there is a technique called breast compression that can make a huge difference if you find that your baby is falling asleep at the breast then well imagine your baby is attached if you get reclined back and you put your thumb on top of the breast and your fingers underneath like a C shape but quite far back on the breast if you do one squeeze and you keep it squeezed that will manually compress a little batch of those grape like structures which are inside and it will push milk manually out of the breast without your baby having to do a lot of hard work to call down milk and to create a letdown so when your baby feels milk hit in the back of his throat even if he was falling asleep he will start to swallow so you hold the compression and listen out for any extra swallows your baby does without one and when there's no more swallowing you can find another area to compress and you can literally work your way around the clock face doing breast compressions and i have provided a link on this slide to a video on the breastfeeding companion that will talk to you about breast compressions if you want to see that in more detail there's also a link to the sleepy baby video as well because it is really important that your baby is able to get milk even if he or she happens to be sleepy at this at this time often babies will start to become more alert after that second or third week but it's during that period when they are sleepy where it can become very tricky 
if if you are not doing strategies that will help your baby to get milk. The other thing that can happen is that babies may struggle to latch at first or, or even not latch at all. Some babies latch and they may do a few fast sucks but then they kind of almost lose interest and don't do a lot of swallowing. So as I say you can use breast compressions for babies that are actually latching but not swallowing. But if they're not latching at all, sometimes that can be to do with the shape of um, your nipples. If your nipples are flat or inverted or particularly short, it might just pose an added challenge for your baby. So expressing your milk, certainly with your hand for the first two days after the birth, is important while you've got colostrum. But once your mature milk starts to come in, it's more effective to have a, a hospital grade double pump. And you can hire these pumps as well. If you're at home a hospital grade double pump will help to keep your supply up you just need to pump every two to three hours for a 10 minute slot each time to tell your body to make milk and you're doing this in place of your baby doing it really because as a standalone feature your body needs to make milk and your baby can then have that milk by another means but have your breast milk so I have provided a link as well to certain hire pump companies if you do need to hire a pump in, in a circumstance like that. It's possible that your baby could have a tongue tie. Uh, a tongue tie is when the frenulum, this little tight band of tissue under the tongue, is too tight almost so that it's causing a restriction of your baby's tongue which is impacting on breastfeeding. Now, some babies do have a, a tongue tie, which isn't actually impacting. So not all tongue ties need to be rectified, but there is a, a very simple procedure that can be performed by um, tongue tie practitioners within the NHS or privately that can release that tongue tie if your baby has an issue with that, which is affecting breastfeeding. But I would encourage you to seek out uh, support from your infant feeding team around breastfeeding because sometimes it's a breastfeeding related issue and not necessarily the tongue tie that is causing that issue. Um, sometimes it can be the shape or the size of nipples which is temporarily causing an issue. Um, so do do seek out extra support around that because it is still quite a, a tricky and controversial issue. Um, and there are many women who, parents who go and have the tongue tie division done and they still have an issues because it was other factors as well which would, was causing the, the problem. If you've had a caesarean section, then it can cause some added challenges just time-wise to get breastfeeding established at the beginning after of course you would have had a um, surgery basically so it, it does stand to reason that you would be more incapacitated and you will need that extra help to get positioning with your baby and all of those kind of things. Once again I've provided a link to specific video around that if you do find yourself in that situation. If your baby is born prematurely and that means before 37 weeks gestation. Once again, that can present some different challenges, but it doesn't mean that breastfeeding can't happen. And there are many ways to go forward if your baby is born early. Lots of skin to skin can be done, even if your baby is born very prematurely. You can express your milk with a hospital grade pump and this will build up your supply and that milk can be given to your baby by a different means if your baby or babies are unable to attach at the breast. You're looking, you're aiming really for eight to 12 pumping sessions in 24 hours, once at night. And you can use massage and warmth and hand expression. All of these things will help to increase the yield of milk that is made. And you're actually aiming for 750 mils per day for a baby. If you have more than one baby, that would be double the amount of that or triple with triplets. 
cup feeding is another means of being able to feed your baby breast milk. And once again, that is a specific, there is a specific technique for that, which I've referred you to a, a particular link to talk through that, that technique. This section is called early weeks and what to expect. It's all about getting your breast milk established during this time. So what can you expect? Very importantly, it's going to be very intensive and you won't get much sleep and it can feel terribly abnormal in in these first few weeks. A lot of women say that they did not <clears throat> anticipate just how intensive it was going to be. But if you prepare yourself for lots of frequent feeding, lots of, you know, working on attachment, needing support from the people around you and, uh, and not a lot of sleep, I think that would be safe to say that that is realistic. But know that you and your baby are definitely hardwired to breastfeed. It's a bit like learning to ride a bike where you get on your bike you sometimes fall off you sometimes scrape your knee and get back on again and learn and gradually gradually things start to improve but that first initial few weeks are extremely intensive but this is normal so expect the frequent feeding marathons that i've already mentioned the cluster nursing the growth spurts it, it's half the battle when you know what is normal and remember the babies can feed <clears throat> potentially in hundreds of different positions all the way around the clock face of the breast some babies have literally fed upside down hanging over the shoulder of a mum which might sound far-fetched but it, it's just to give you that idea that there are so many positions and if you were on a desert island with your baby you would work this thing out without any input from any anybody. There's no internet or anything on this desert island. You can't just Google positions or whatever. You would work this thing out and pain would actually be your guide. So that is one of the key things with positioning. Once your baby does the initial fast sucks, once the milk lets down after that, because those fast sucks can be quite strong in the first couple of weeks, but once the milk lets down, it should feel easier if your nipple is in a good place. Pulling and tugging would be normal, but pain is a step too far. So let pain be your guide and be really, really strict about taking your baby off. Break the seal. A little finger in the corner of your baby's mouth will break that seal so your baby can come off. And even if the feed, fe the latch feels okay, if suddenly you move or your baby moves and readjusts and you start to feel pain somewhere throughout that feed, then once again, be really strict about taking your baby off. So look after your side of the equation because it only takes a couple of latches like that where you've gritted your teeth all the way through a feed and you've sustained some damage to your nipple. A couple of latches like that and you probably will struggle to bring your baby to the breast on that particular side because of the the trauma to your nipple but nipples do heal up really well given the right circumstances so you know once you get that latch better again then even so nipples can start to heal up you don't necessarily have to have a total break from breastfeeding for your nipples to heal up they'll start to heal up really well when you get that deeper latch. Also use your support network wherever you can, any offers of help. Limit your visitors in the early weeks if you can, just to give you an opportunity to get breastfeeding established and access um, professional support if you need that as well from health professionals. Know where your, your support is. So a lot of people ask about expressing and whether or not that's important to do in the in the early weeks is it is it a good thing to do or not if your baby is feeding well at the breast there is no need to express your milk and certainly for the first few weeks anywhere between 4 to 6 weeks it can be a really good 
useful thing to be able to just keep your baby at the breast because every day your baby has to tell your body to make that little bit more milk than the than the day before even and your breast milk builds up the amount you make it usually plateaus though around about four or five or six weeks so it becomes a bit more stable the amount you make after that and usually women will start to express the milk around that time so your your breast milk is just being built up to cater for the needs of your baby in those first few weeks so if feeding's going fine try to just keep your baby at the breast as opposed to expressing because expressing will alter the supply and demand and it's possible you could make more milk than you need because you're introducing expressing unnecessarily some women never express the milk all the way through breastfeeding but many women do want that um, flexibility and choice so they kind of start expressing round about six weeks but there are certain circumstances where you may need to express because expressing is a way that you can a way to boost your supply if there's any issues with your baby not getting enough milk at the beginning so there are certain circumstances where expressing would be warranted in that first few weeks and breastfeeding in public is another question that women bring up you know some can feel quite uh, upset or worried about feeding out and about so i have referred you to a, a link there to a, a specific video around breastfeeding in public and it can be really useful for a supportive partner to come out to um, a baby group or a breastfeeding group with yourself in the early days just to boost your confidence really to get out and about because once you've done it once it can usually feel a lot easier and then of course you've got the added support of other women with babies or parents with babies whatever kind of group you're going to so do have a look at that video in this section i wanted to talk about some common breastfeeding challenges and how to overcome them and rather than me talking through every single one of these things i will put on each slide a link to a specific video that i've already recorded around these things because not all of you will experience these things some women sail through breastfeeding and may not never need to ask for help around anything like that because they haven't encountered that so it's just for you to know that if you do encounter these things there is available information so what some of the some of the topics on on this section are breasts getting overly full dealing with block ducts and preventing mastitis uh, ways to boost supply dealing with a sleepy baby that we've already mentioned a little bit about that a fast letdown um, sometimes you can have a very fast letdown which causes your baby to cough and splutter uh, some women have an oversupply of milk which can cause babies to be quite unsettled uh, with digestive issues sore nipples of course that's a very important topic you know to be able to deal with that and find the cause breastfeeding after a cesarean we've mentioned we've mentioned tongue tie thrush some women experience um, thrush on the nipples or inside the breast the baby may have thrush inside the mouth all of these things can be treated and worked through and they're, they're all temporary hurdles the last thing is breast refusal which um we have got specific information on that as well so on this slide i have put if things are not going so smooth initially think about skin to skin at least two hours in 24 hours and the safety issues around that think about try and laid back biological positions to aid a deeper latch because sometimes for the lack of that knowledge around biological nurturing women have struggled to get that good latch think about trying breast compressions if your baby is not doing a lot of swallowing at the breast 
this will help to boost supply and it can avoid lots of pumping and offering formula which we find lots of people being encouraged to do for the lack of breast compressions so try that technique try a hospital grade double pump to support and help to build up your supply if there are any issues at the beginning where your baby isn't working hard enough at first and nipple shields that is another topic especially if you have flat or inverted nipples or particularly short nipples the nipple shield is actually a really good an important tool to aid attachment. Nipple shields were given a very bad press years ago because they were used in a wrong way. They were given out a lot if, if you were sore right at the beginning after having a baby. And this is really at a time when we didn't have a lot of knowledge around positioning and attachment. So nipple shields were made out of thick latex that were given out routinely and some of those types of nipple shields could actually affect the milk supply <coughs> so they were given a, a negative press really rightly and they were thrown out as, a, as a, a useful tool but actually in recent years the thin silicon nipple shield can be in specific circumstances particularly where you have flat or inverted nipples or particularly short nipples that are causing a challenge for your baby, the nipple shield can aid the mechanics of the latch to help breastfeeding to continue. So bear that in mind if there are issues around latching. And it's important, of course, that all the principles are put in place, as we've mentioned, but the nipple shield is sometimes a tool that is absolutely necessary for certain women <coughs> with a particular babies. And some women have used the nipple shield just on one side if the nipple is flatter or shorter on one side or inverted. Some have used them on both sides. Some have got rid of the nipple shield as the days and the weeks have gone on. Some have used them for months. Some have used them for the whole of their breastfeeding experience. Um, but it is a good tool so bear that in mind if there are particular issues going on at the beginning this slide talks about as time goes by so once again i'm going to link you to videos specific to these topics around changing patterns expressing and storing going back to work or study starting solids and when and how to stop breastfeeding. Finally, just to recap really, get support in place and especially from those who are going to support your wish to breastfeed. Know where to access skilled breastfeeding support like your well baby clinic, virtual drop-ins, in-house drop-ins, helplines, in your local area or nationally. If you experience any pain or discomfort, get help as soon as possible. Have someone who will take the baby from you and, and let you sleep at times if needed. Try to keep your expectations realistic. If you have a bad day, remember why you wanted to breastfeed and take pride in what you have achieved, however long you do it whether it's days or weeks or months. And in regard to getting support, ask your midwife or health visitor. There are breastfeeding organisations like National Childbirth Trust, which is the NCT, Breastfeeding Network, BFN, LLL, La Leche League. There's the Association of Breastfeeding Mothers, ABM, They've all got helplines that are run by trained volunteer mums who've had a, a, an extensive training actually and they run throughout the year and usually up to about 9 or 10 o'clock at night. You can also find lots of information on the breastfeedingcompanion.com So thank you very much for watching this webinar. I do f hope that you found it useful and that you will continue to refer to it once you've had your baby as well to learn as much as you can and be equipped 
in your breastfeeding journey ahead of you. I wish you every success.